Hello everyone, the Green Scorpion here, and welcome to another patron requested countdown, this time coming to us from Jeremy Thompson. Jeremy and I actually go way back, even before I started working on YouTube, and we've even performed on stage together. So it's fitting that a performer such as he would bring up such a relevant topic. Voice cues have been in games for a long time, but with the rapid evolution in sound cards, games have required more and more out of their casts, especially in the last decade. Games tend to be longer experiences than animated feature films, and I can attest that screaming into a microphone for more than an hour can be pretty taxing. It might seem easier than live acting, since they don't have to worry about physicality, but I'd argue it's harder to convey believable emotion without the crutch of facial expressions. Still, they develop our favorite characters and drive home the plot, all with considerably less job security, so let's give them the appreciation they deserve. While I'll be leaning more towards my own experiences, I'm lifting the only games I've played rule, instead instituting an only languages I speak rule. I know that many of these games are localized, but I wouldn't have much to say about an original Japanese performance, now would I? Live action and cartoon actors are still eligible, but we're only considering their contribution to gaming. So, drink some tea and readjust your sound levels. These are my top 10 video game voice actors. Check, one, two, check. Let's get started. What do you want with me? I will teach you the flying kick. Like I give a flying, mm, you know. Even though I'm stressing quality over quantity, I wanted each entry to have at least a few roles that establish them in the gaming medium. Even if she'd never done anything else in her life, though, I'd have listed Ella McLean for one singular character. Look, we both said a lot of things that you're going to regret. But I think we can put our differences behind us. For science, you monster. True, a lot of what makes GLaDOS so hateably lovable is the writing, but we need to credit McLean on how effortless she makes this sound. The first portal is hinged on this one speaking role who spends the entire game taunting and ridiculing you. Do you understand how horribly wrong that could have gone? Rather than go for an established character actor, Valve picked up this opera singer from Nashville, and the results are pure poetry. Props to the delicate evolution of the character over the course of the two games. What starts as a standard, monotone voice slowly sneaks in some dry wit and some sinister undertones. As you escape the testing rooms and make way for her power source, her superiority slowly gives way to wrath and desperation. Come time for the sequel, and you hit this strange subtext where she treats you less like a murderer and more like an ex-girlfriend. McLean specializes in disembodied voices. She's in every game in the orange box, notably as the administrator in Team Fortress 2, where her disappointment in the losing team carries all of the sting of a disappointed mother. And on a personal note, I am very, very disappointed with you. Pretty funny because in real life she's married to John Patrick Lowry, the voice of the sniper. Forget Redman and Blue Tart, this is the real conspiracy. Sticking with Valve, she voices the witch in Left 4 Dead, and GLaDOS everywhere else. I remember all of my friends wanting to go see Pacific Rim, mainly because the AI had GLaDOS' voice. As for her singing career, we've heard her sing multiple times. Not only did she sing the credits theme to both games, which again, make as appropriate breakup ballads as they do villain songs, they also snuck in some opera with Cara Mia Adio. Yeah, the turret opera. That's her. Since then, she's been following GLaDOS in dozens of cameos, and using her public persona to support benefit programs like Gamer X. Who knew a killer computer could be such a humanitarian? Good news. I figured out what that thing you just incinerated did. It was a morality core they installed after I flooded the enrichment center with a deadly neurotoxin to make me stop flooding the enrichment center with a deadly neurotoxin. This one is coming straight out of my childhood. Steve Bloom was introduced to me as the voice of Tom, the host of Cartoon Network's Toonami. At first I thought of him more for his cartoon voiceovers, but since the Guinness Book of World Records awarded him the title of most prolific video game voice actor in 2012, yeah, we should probably acknowledge that. Bloom's talent lies in his range and grimness. His voice goes deep. Very deep. He's very growly when he needs to be, and he's great for imposing villains, team bruisers, and grumpy curmudgeons. Even his nice guys are usually pretty growly. It's incredible how many variations on the tough guy he can do. Erdnot Grunt is violent but full of hope, 
Rexar is like a bear just learned English. Jack Kamen aloofly cares about people, but will still smoke in front of your infant child. And Ogryn is laughing off all of his pain. The connecting thread is that all of his characters have been through hell. They've seen some things, and you can hear it in the gravel of their drawl. You would risk your race's extinction. The threat of it makes me dangerous. You evoke pity, not fear. If a game doesn't have the time to establish a character's tragic backstory, that's fine, just put Bloom in the role and we'll completely understand. I mean, does anyone remember what Jack Kamen's deal is? Probably not, you just assume he has a good reason to be this world-weary. And while Steve Bloom may have a typecast, he'll surprise you at times. Sure, he's the voice of raspy robot overlord Jerginga, but did you know he's also Jerginga's lackey Wana? Yeah, he has his fair share of high squeaky voices and everything in between, including Wolverine in most video games, and even a pretty boy like Vincent Valentine. Whatever register he's in, you know you're going to get an oddly textured performance that sticks in your head. But none of that actually matters. What really matters is that he said my name at a convention with the Ogryn voice! Wow, Jeremy, I have a lot to thank you for today. I'm Ogryn, and I support the Green Scorpion on YouTube. Also Second, I got a barf. <laughs> <laughs> Actor, martial artist, musician, Johnny Young Bosch has achieved a lot for someone so young. Wait, he's 40? Looking good, man. Mighty Morphin fans may recognize him as the second Black Ranger, Adam Park. You know, the one from the movie who gets stuck with the frog spirit. It was a great start for him, but his big break was an anime. If you watch English dubs, you've heard him before. He's in Bleach, Naruto, Dorarada, Gurren Lagann, Eureka 7, Digimon Tri, he's freaking Bash the Stampede! Naturally, he's around for any games based around these animes, but his experience playing cool, ornery, show off -y teenagers easily found use for original characters. Most of these games are anime-like, and some even become anime. And in that event, he follows them back into their anime adaptations, such as Hajime Hinata from Danganronpa, or Yu Narakami from Persona 4. He may mostly play adolescence, but that's not to say there isn't range. A major example is Emil from Tales of Symphonia, Dawn of a New World. I can't say he's my favorite Tales protagonist, I even prefer Guy Cecil who Bosch also voiced, but I like the timidity and the believable yet still over-the-top stammering he puts on Emil, which contrasts greatly with his own split personality and really highlights the game's main story beats and character arc. But you've got a pocket knife, right? That's for carving wood. Yeah, but it's still better than the axe you chop up monsters with. Compare that to Snarky Snark Nero from Devil May Cry 4. And did you know he also did the motion capture for him? Johnny Young Bosch might be the closest thing our world has to a real Shonen Jump hero. Lastly, he's the voice of Zero in games like Marvel vs. Capcom 3. But no, he's not the one from Mega Man X4. Forever a Power Ranger, Johnny Young Bosch always knows what he's fighting for. Try to remember the crime scene. There was no blood on the floor. Allow me to cut through those words. I knew I wanted to talk about this guy the instant I learned that Travis Touchdown and the medic were the same voice. Seriously, do these two sound like the same guy to you? You gotta be shitting me. Where are your precious papers now, dumb cops? Robert Atkin Downs is more aptly titled a voice artist. He's done plenty of acting in voice and live action. His colorful career also includes music producer, motion capture model, and even a bit of directing. Fun fact, as an actor, he holds the record for being in the most theatrically released movies with Batman. But all those movies came out in 2016. I just thought that was interesting. Though he was born in London, he pursued much of his training in the US and earned his Master of Fine Arts at Temple University. Represent. Perhaps it's because he's so well-traveled that he's able to flawlessly replicate over 60 dialects, and adjust them to make them more or less cartoony if need be. I'm not just talking about Russian accent or German accent, he's like that guy from My Fair Lady, he can narrow it down to a street corner. And when you need ham, he goes ham. Besides international impersonations, a large area of his catalog includes characters who have some kind of authority. General George Washington, Lord Gregor Forrester, Master Kazuhira Miller. These characters are large, in charge, and smarter than you. 
most of the time. He also does creature sound effects. You can hear his renditions of many hideous monsters, which he sound edits himself, particularly the locusts from Gears of War. Or Resistance, where he's both the hero Joseph Capelli and the alien beast Daedalus. Wow, we really are our own demons. And he's been a ton of Marvel characters in games, but rarely the same one twice. Whether it's fixing cars for Eddie Riggs or serving in Organization 13, you'll never know where you'll hear him next. You! I'd rather we just skip the formalities. From one Prince of Persia to another, at number 6 we have perhaps the most mimetic video game voice actor, Nolan North. I mean, of course he's here! He's Nathan freaking Drake! Much like the intrepid adventurer, North's career up to this point has been a wild ride. He's a news reporter turned stand-up comedian turned soap opera star turned video game action hero. North's acting career started pretty low-key, cast on Port Charles, which was a spin-off of General Hospital. It was cancelled and North turned to voice acting, but his physicality was well preserved, Uncharted becoming the pioneer for effective motion captured animation thanks to North's charisma. North describes the experience a lot like being in theater, where you succeed by using imagination and being willing to make an ass out of yourself to find out what works. Other studios don't always give him as much room to explore the character, Desmond Miles being fairly rigid in comparison. But then you see him wind up in weird places like Ratchet and Clank and Sly Cooper. Enjoy your words, Cooper, because they will be your last. He does a lot of higher voices, but can go deep when it comes to his multiple appearances in the Dota 2 roster. Oh, and did I mention that he's the Adventure Core, the Fact Core, and the Space Core? <laughs> you know what we need more of? Let me guess. <laughs> Space? <laughs> <laughs> Space. Oh, for the love of- He's also great at impersonating other actors. In fact, he claims he once did fill-in work for John Travolta and Christopher Walken, which came in handy when he became the new voice for Ghost in the updates and expansions of Destiny, replacing Peter Dinklage. Though I can't help but feel that Robert Reynolds is impersonating him when it comes to Deadpool. Yeah, Nolan North is the quintessential animated voice for the Merc with a Mouth. And then there's Saints Row. Many of the big actors get gigs as voice sets for these games. But in Saints Row 4, one preset character is explicitly named President Nolan North. The gaming industry loves him, and so do I. Nolan! Hey, what's up, buddy? We're making a game about me! Gotta have you do the VO, man. I mean, see, here's the thing. People tell me we sound alike. That sounds awesome, Deadpool. Listen, I had a different take on it. Maybe we just make you... You know, maybe it's an alternative type of Deadpool. You know, it's somebody who's like, like, forget the boobs, let's just go for pecs. You know, pecs and biceps, forget girls. Why don't you just contact my agent for the booking and, and we'll see what we can do. Ha <laughs> he's so in. Look, Deadpool, I, I got another call coming in, gotta take it. Uh, good luck with the game, though. There are nights I lay awake, staring at the ceiling, and thinking about my one biggest anxiety. Someday, Charles Martinet is going to retire. Will Mario have a new voice? An imitator? Or will they try to get by just by recycling old voice clips for all eternity? Any way you slice it, the gaming industry will have lost something dear. Seriously, look at this guy! Being the voice of one of the most recognizable characters in any media the world over, he at least needed an honorary spot. But he's not just Mario, he's also Luigi, Baby Mario, Baby Luigi, Toadsworth, Wario, Waluigi, and the Piantas. I don't think he gets enough credit for the Piantas, those guys sound hilarious. From this one franchise alone, he has practically the longest resume of anyone in the industry. I mean, he's not exactly doing Shakespeare, but hold that thought. These roles are mostly grunts and catchphrases. But the story behind it all is pretty inspiring. He grew up in California, Paris, and Barcelona. He's actually trilingual. After giving up a law degree in his senior year, he tried some acting classes simply to overcome his own fear of public speaking. This guy! His first Mario gig wasn't even a game. Nintendo was doing a trade show demoing a concept called Mario in Real Time, where a screen would immediately and horrifyingly animate whatever the actor said. 
So Nintendo needed someone to play the plumber and chat with people from behind a curtain. And Charles Martinet crashed the audition. Now, think of every previous rendition of Mario. Everybody figured, okay, Italian plumber from the Bronx, standard low, shubbly voice. But Martinet decided to experiment with something a little more active, something high-pitched that kids would enjoy. Add his ability to ad-lib for hours on end, and Nintendo executives were in love. It's -a me, Mario. Okie dokie, let's make a pizza pie together. You go get some sausage, I'm gonna get some spaghetti. We're gonna put the spaghetti and the sausage in the sweet pizza. Then, I'm gonna chase you with the pizza. If I catch you with the pizza, you gotta chase me with the pizza. But first you gotta eat the pizza, then you're gonna chase me. Then we're gonna make a spaghetti meatballs. If I make sure the spaghetti meatballs, I catch you with the spaghetti meatballs. Then you gotta eat the meatballs. Oh, mamma mia. And it just so happens the higher register perfectly translates in-game, complementing the actions of the character. Would launching through space in Super Mario Galaxy have the same charm if our hero didn't jubilate at the top of his lungs? He turns a decent round of golf into a cause for celebration. He's just... He's Mario. I've been following him on social media for some time, and I've even met him at a convention. He's the nicest guy and really seems thankful for his success. He also makes these vacation videos with his Mario figurines on Facebook. They are delightful. He's elevated the brothers to greater recognition than Mickey Mouse or Bugs Bunny. And given how universal Mario is, it's really amusing to learn what other roles he's lent his voice to. Are you guys ready to have your minds blown? Mario is Orvis, a keeper of time in Ratchet and Clank. Not weird enough for you? Mario is William Shakespeare and Ludwig von Beethoven in Carmen Sandiego's Great Chase Through Time. Wait, I'm not done. Mario is Foulmouth, a 1940s cartoon duck from Cell Damage that speaks almost entirely in expletives. Mario is Vigoro, a muscle-lugging woman-molesting commander from Skies of Arcadia. Mario is the Great Bearded Dragon Parthenax. I'm sorry for rambling, I just wanted to improve your life by telling you that. So... You have made your way here to me. No easy task for a jaw, mortal. Even for one of Dova Sauce, Dragon Blood. It may not be my cup of tea, but I can't just ignore Halo. I mean, it's a million mile installation floating in the sky. I see it on my way to work. But no, seriously. It's one of those games that got people into games, like Final Fantasy VII or Ms. Pac-Man. I know most people played it only for the multiplayer and the last entry came out with a resounding lack of hype, but to actual fans of the lore, there's a lot to get into, anchored by the charm of its main character, Cortana. Sure, Master Chief is the protagonist and all, but all of the emotion and heart of the story revolves around this artificial intelligence, all thanks to the tireless work of Jen Taylor. Why is it that the AIs are often the most interesting characters? It's not like she's a well-known actress otherwise, being one of the few entries on this list not to come over from television. I think that's part of the characterization though. It feels sincere. And though she's critical to this grand saga with galaxies in the balance, she still has this hometown humility. It's a cool counterpoint playing both Cortana and her creator Dr. Halsey. She puts her all into this script that could feel really sterile in the hands of a less capable actress. And her emotions are easy to read. You know me. When I make a promise. You... keep it. I do know how to pick them. Lucky me. The character Taylor built is so relatable that to give Halo 4 some humility, 343 Industries had to resort to killing her. Then, at a loss in Halo 5, they bring her back. I guess they didn't think Nathan Fillion would be charming enough. Taylor's resume is quality over quantity, though she has done some other roles here and there. One of her first was Sunny Day, the recurring commentator in backyard baseball, football, and basketball. Man, those games take me back. She's also Lieutenant Kira Stokes in Fear 2, She's a few characters in Dota 2. She was Princess Peach. She's Zoe from Left 4 Dead. Wait, 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 go back! She was Princess Peach? Yeah! She held the role for 10 years. 
also Toad, Toadette, a few times Daisy, and in one interesting case, Birdo. It's not like Peach is the role of the year, mind you, but it's just hilarious to me that the voice of Cortana, the leading lady of the games that saved the Xbox, Microsoft's version of Siri, is also Princess Peach. And furthermore, that Peach, who is sometimes criticized as the most vapid example of the damsel in distress trope, was portrayed by the same woman who brought us this really nuanced character. Get yourself a voice actress who can do both. Then again, she started the trend where Toad sounds like a parrot on helium scraping across a chalkboard. So maybe this was some sort of internal sabotage. Either way, she's not in the Mario games anymore. But if you want more Jen Taylor, you can hear her as the mysterious narrator in Ruby. Or you can wait for Halo 6. Or ask a question on Windows 10. Come on, Chief. Take a girl for a ride. The previous three entries have been notable for one particular role, but Laura Bailey is a jack of all trades. Starting off as an acting major in a Texas community college, Bailey was scouted to audition for Funimation when they were just beginning to dub anime. She was appreciated for her unexpected and endearing character choices, like the raspiness she added to Kid Trunks in Dragon Ball Z. Not to linger on anime too much, but she also got the lead role as Toru in Fruits Basket, and in interviews, she says that she's gotten a lot of inspiration from the character for her unwavering optimism. I think that's why I like Laura Bailey. I feel she really listens to and internalizes her characters. I love Bianca from Dragon Age, that rare example of a woman dwarf, and I think she saves Gears of War 4 as Kate Diaz. She's sometimes the voice of Oma Chow, which normally I would dock points for, I hate that thing, but she's also a bunch of Silent Hill characters, so I'll look the other way. And Hupo from Klonoa? Why are you trying to make me cry here? She spent a lot of time doing stage plays in college, which shows through her ability to sculpt monologues. Listen to some of Lady Comstock's audio logs, the ups and downs of her delivery really draw you in, feeling really dramatic but at the same time like a real part of this world. Or her sudden mood swings in Catherine. It's seriously unnerving. Careful, you keep making faces like that and you'll start getting wrinkles, you old granny. As a result, it's not surprising that she's also now a voice director for many projects. She's married to another successful voice actor, Travis Willingham, which creates even better celebrity couples than the administrator and the sniper. So, get this. Chun-Li is married to Guile. Blaze is married to Knuckles. And my favorite, Lust, is married to Roy Mustang. How's that for a lover's quarrel? She may not be Mario or Cortana or Nathan Drake, but those big names shouldn't distract us from her remarkable repertoire, a menagerie of colorful, detailed, and beloved characters. And also Omachow. Whether you need a simple action hero or a nuanced case study, Laura Bailey's probably the actress for you. And if not, well, she certainly knows how to curse you out. Start making sense, you rotten book, or you're gonna be sorry. Maybe I'll rip your pages out one by one, or maybe I'll put you in the goddamn furnace. How can someone with such a big, smart brain get hypnotized like a little bitch, huh? Oh, Shadow Lord, I love you, Shadow Lord. Come over here and give Vice a big, sloppy kiss, Shadow Lord. Now pull your head out of your goddamn ass and start fucking helping us! You know what's hard? Playing the main character. It's a lot of pressure to be had. You know what's even harder? Playing a character people actually want to be around. When you need the latter though, there's one choice that beats all the rest. Jennifer Hale. Jennifer Hale and Laura Bailey were neck and neck in the rankings for me. Both great actresses who've done substantial work. While Bailey has a longer docket of notable roles, I think Hale's characters are harder to play and result in compelling multi-dimensional characters every single time. And we are so lucky to have her. She originally was focused on her rock band, and doing voiceover work was just a way to pay for equipment until she discovered she really loved it. She has a lot of cartoon credit as well, with some humble roles really important to my childhood, including Miss Keen, Katnape, and Avatar Kiyoshi. 
Oh, and the majority of the women Johnny Bravo hits on, oddly enough. But her career's brightest achievements are in video games. So here's the thing about video game heroes. Oftentimes, they don't talk a lot. Many games prefer to keep a protagonist mostly silent, making it easier for the player to imagine themselves in the role. This is especially true in Hale's genre of choice, Western RPGs. The critical voice jobs here are the companions, the ones with all the lines, the voice you're usually listening to. Characters like Ophelia from Brutal Legend, Bastila Shawn from Knights of the Old Republic, Naomi Hunter from Metal Gear Solid. And when I say these roles are difficult, I mean they'd be really easy to make boring. They're always so grounded and relatable, even the fantastic ones. How do you make a half-naked assassin with five lightsabers so freaking poignant? You are the crownless king, the one who got out. You reached the top, then walked away. Well, it helps that she's been doing it for so long. She's in some of the earliest voice-capable games, Baldur's Gate, X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter, even Math Blasters. So to see all of that experience culminate in a performance like Dragon Age's Crema Classy, it's a treat. And it's not like she's incapable of the starring role either, she's Commander Shepard for crying out loud. And the good Samus Aran. While others may stand out, memorable for their work, Hale dissolves, fameless into the body of her career. Her peers have referred to her as the Meryl Streep of game voiceovers, and yet she's very unrecognized. And she's okay with that. It ties into Hale's philosophy on performing. She's quoted as saying that she enjoys her anonymity, because in games, the player's experience is primary. She just wants to help you have the best experience possible. Yet for her characters to be so dynamic and empathetic, yeah, Meryl Streep seems fitting. Jennifer Hale, you deserve an Oscar. Surprising. Surprising that it worked? Surprising that it didn't kill him. But a magnetic repulsive field around one's body can come in handy. If it doesn't kill you. A fair point. Troy Baker. It has to be Troy Baker. I mean, I don't want to apply scaling value to real people who actually exist here, but Troy mother effing Baker! Previously a radio announcer and member of indie rock bands, Troy Baker also fell into Funimation. And I'd tell you about his work in anime, but we just don't have the time. There's too much gaming to cover. I mentioned a second ago with Jennifer Hale that, as companion characters, she gets a lot of lines, because oftentimes player characters are blank slates you can paint yourself on. Troy Baker breaks that curve. Usually in the starring role, his voice work is expressive and distinct, bursting with grizzled personality while still being completely sympathetic. When his characters lie, you know what's really going on in their head. You hear every emotional beat change in his performance, and it doesn't take away from the story or gameplay. It enhances the experience. His first big role was Sergeant Matt Baker from Brothers in Arms, and after that he just snowballed down a mountain of gigs. He's got the flawed, morally conflicted anti-anti-hero thing down to a science, but never sticks too much into a cliched pattern. The variations in this theme inform us of the entire world for the game he's in. Like the difference between Shadow of Mordor's Talion and Catherine's Vincent Brooks. Both are emotionally exhausted everyman who can justify hurting people around them. But one game is a dark survivalist sandbox while the other is a quirky, introspective romance drama. And you understand the tone of these games as soon as you meet the hero. Of course, the actions of a character are largely the work of a writer, but it's Baker's performance that gives them emotional weight. When Joel made that rash decision at the end of The Last of Us, players freaked out, because they loved Joel. We may not have agreed with his actions, but we struggled with his plight right along with him. And then they were betrayed. How could he do this to us? And I know a lot of people hate Snow from Final Fantasy XIII, but once you accept that he's just a thick-skulled dude bro, you find a performance where Baker's just having the time of his life. That's some crowd. Gonna need a plan. <laughs> I... Since when have heroes ever needed plans? I think Troy Baker understood the tone of this game better than the writers did. Uncharted 4? Huh. Funny how Nathan Drake never mentioned his brother Sam. But we don't care because it's Nolan North and his brother Troy Baker. Speaking of Nolan North, let's check the Batman scale again. Troy Baker has played Batman, and Robin, and the Joker. My favorite is this tucked away moment of Bioshock Infinite, when his character Booker DeWitt plays the guitar, 
That's Troy Baker playing the guitar! Will the circle be unbroken by and by, by and by, is a better That is phenomenal! So why is it that we so often credit movies to the actors in them, and yet video games to a faceless corporation? Sure, there's different elements to a game, but even down to the characters? How is it Capcom can refuse to bring back TJ Rotolo for Dead Rising 4, and still advertise it with Frank West is back? Or Konami can toss out David Hayter as Snake, and expect no one to care? just because a more famous actor has taken his place. Writers make the characters, programmers decide how we interact with them, companies own the rights. But without Laura Bailey, would Cortana be the same person? Without Nolan North, would Uncharted be the same game? So for Troy Baker, Jennifer Hale, Charles Martinet, and all of the voice actors we don't see, this is my sincere thank you. You deserve every ounce of recognition we can give you. Because without the consistent work of passionate performers, things just wouldn't be the same. I'm the Green Scorpion, and I want to give Jeremy Thompson one last big thanks for this topic. I really enjoyed the opportunity to learn more about these people. And if you want to see me tackle a topic of your choice, maybe check out the reward system on my Patreon. Either way, thanks for watching everyone. See you guys next time. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, by and by? Is a better home awaiting in the sky, in the sky? You can picture happy gatherings round the fireside long ago. And you think of tearful partings when they left you here below. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, by and by? Is a better home awaiting in the sky, in the sky, one by one there? Seats were emptied, and one by one, they went away. Now the family is parted. Will it be complete one day? Will the circle be unbroken? By and by, by and by, is a better home awaiting in the sky, in the sky.